My name is David, and this is a very quick view into a compiler. Let's get started. What is a compiler? A compiler is a program transforming code written in one language, the source language, into another language, the target language. In terms of C++, we primarily think of a compiler of programs translating our human-readable C++ source code into machine-readable object code. Famous compilers include GCC, Clang, and Microsoft Visual C++. A compiler is usually represented as, consi as consisting of multiple separate stages. On the left, we have our source code. It is passed to the compiler's front end. The job of the front end is to convert the human-readable source code into a so-called intermediate representation, from now on referred to as the IR. The IR is then passed to the middle end, commonly also called the optimizer. The optimizer's job is to analyze and transform the liberal source code into a more optimized version of itself without changing the meaning of it. It is where the most of the compiler's time is spent. Last but not least comes the back end, converting the optimized IR received from the last stage into machine-dependent object code. There. And this object code can then later be combined into an executable which can be run. Let's have the first stage, the front end. The front end is usually split into four sub-stages. The preprocessor, the lexer, the parser, the analyzer. Let's start with the preprocessor. The preprocessor's job is to handle source file inclusion, macro replacement, and conditional inclusion. He's going to transform our input source code on the left into our fully preprocessed output on the right by going through a few well-defined steps. As you can see here right now, the preprocessor is uh, kind of a leftover from C and is very C and C++ specific. You might not find it in different languages, but I still wanted to include that. Next, we have the lexer. Bjorn already talked about the lexer right now, and the lexer is splitting our source code into tokens, snippets of text categorized into different predefined categories like identifier, literal, punctuator, as you've just seen. On the left, we have a little snippet of C++ source code. It's a function adding two integers together. Pretty simple. Everybody's seen that. And now we're going to quickly go through how the lexer would split that into tokens. First, we have the two keywords, which are int and return, represented by the color yellow here. Next, we would have the identifier, add. Following that, we would have um, them separated by so-called punctuators that is either white space or parentheses, braces, semicolons, etc. He represented in red. Next, we have our numbers in the source code, 5 and 10. Those are, in this case, integer literals. And last but not least, we have an operator, the plus operator, represented in orange. As a second to last element in our, in our front end, we have the parser, turning the just produced tokens into a presentation easily consumable by the steps followed that. And nowadays, this is usually an AST, an abstract syntax tree. The AST is created by traversing the list of tokens created by the lexer. If the input source code is syntactically correct, the compiler will produce a valid syntax tree. If the input source code is syntactically incorrect, the compiler will likely produce a diagnostic for the user, showing an error, and might even stop the compilation process if he cannot recover that error. The following will quickly show how an abstract syntax tree might look like in a compiler. Every compiler implements them very differently, and um, so there's no one solution for everything. At the top, we have our function declaration, int with the return type and add with the identifier. Next, we have the compound statement, which is the body of our function. And this compound statement is containing just one single statement. It's a return statement. The return statement itself consists of a binding operation, adding two integers together, our two integer literals, 5 and 10. As you can see, the compiler has now built a very new representation of the source code. It is not operating on the tokens or on the source text anymore, but on a way more abstract level. So it can build upon that. Yeah, and last but not least, in the front end, we have a very important part, and that is the analyzer. The semantic analyzer, how it's usually called, will now build an assemble table and annotate the syntax tree. Lots of different information is added. For example, the type of variables, which can later be used to do static type checking. The analyzer will then proceed to analyze the so our source code for semantically incorrect constructs by making use of all that new information. For example, if we try to return a string from our, current, our function in the last slide, our add function, we would get an error because the return type was an int and we cannot return a string from that, obviously. The now annotated abstract syntax tree is then passed as the IR, is then converted into the IR and passed into the next stage, the middle end. 
Having now received the IR, the job of the middle end is to analyze and perform optimizations on this IR. This is often in, done in so-called passes. An optimization pass is transforming IR without changing the observable side effects with the goal of either reducing size, improving runtime, or even both. There are many different optimizations a compiler can perform. For example, propagating constants. In the example we've seen before, the compiler probably would have optimized the add function into returning directly the uh, result of the operation we had, 5 plus 10, so we just return a literal 15, since both operands were known in compile time. We can expand inline functions, we can unroll loops, we can eliminate dead code, parallelize sections of code, and many, many more. A compiler has tens if not hundreds of those small optimizations. They are enabled by one critical component, and that is the analysis. Another analysis, sorry. Um, the analysis was crucial, since without the compiler having thorough knowledge about the generated R prior to applying these optimizations, many optimizations would lack fundamental information and would not be possible. For example, to eliminate that code in a branch, we have to know and be absolutely certain that this branch will never be taken. This might even depend on previous optimizations like constant propagation. And to do that, the compiler has several um, analysis, pa uh, analysis passes, like analyze analysis, dependency analysis, as just seen, um, the data flow analysis for constant propagation, everything, and many more. Um, the last stage is called the backend. Um, so far, the compiler was nearly platform and architecture independent. We've been operating on source code and on the AR. Nothing, nothing fancy, nothing specific to one architecture. Now we want to convert the, the uh, architecture-independent IR into an architecture-dependent assembly code. This step is often called the code generation step. To generate efficient assembly from the IR, the backend has to go through a few steps. Um, we start with instruction selection. The backend transforms the IR from the middle end into real assembly. This procedure is, as I said, instruction selection and is done by mapping the operations inside the IR into groups of real instructions. In this step, the registers will be ignored as they will be filled in a later step throughout the process. The compiler might e still perform some platform-dependent, machine-dependent optimizations, which, if deemed necessary, this is not always the case. Uh, one example of such optimization would be, for example, people optimizations. Replacing one set of instructions with another more efficient set while keeping the observable output the same. Coming to the next step, as just said, the re registers were kept out and they will now be filled. Um, since registers are a finite set, the compiler has to decide where to use them and if this is not possible, registers might be spilled on the stack, essentially saving the contents to be picked up later. Next we come to instruction scheduling. All recent CPU designs are, as you might probably know, have very long pipelines and can execute several instructions in parallel. The instruction scheduler tries to avoid stalling the pipeline by rearranging the order of instructions when maintaining the meaning of the code. This step can either be done for, before um, register, register, register allocation or after that, depending on how you want to implement that. Um, and as a very last step, we come to uh, assembling and linking. The, uh, usually in, in old compilers, the assembler and the linker were different from, from the compiler itself, and that is now the, the, the assembly will now be passed to the assembler to, link, uh, to create the machine-dependent actual object codes, the, the bits and bytes, the zeros and ones, because right now we have some internal representation of the assembly, commonly a textual one, and this will now be uh, converted or rather translated, as we can see here. From the left, we have a little assembly snippet, and on the right, that will be translated into the uh, binary code. And as the very last step, we have the linker. The linker will basically combine many more objects, zero or more objects, one or more objects, into a final executable. I think I'm running out of time. And that is perfect, because I am done. Thank you very much. <laughs>